In ancient Mesopotamia, the gods were imagined to be constantly at work in the world, and in the human efforts to understand these divine actors and their influence, societies developed the practice of divination. This field included astrology, ecstasy, and lacanomancy, which function in varied ways depending on the time and place. The standard written materials associated with divination only first appeared in the Old Babylonian period, but an earlier oral tradition surely precedes this, as divination was already well developed when it was first put to clay. The practice seems nearly ubiquitous across the 3,000-year history of the ancient Near East, informing the actions of the Hittites, Assyrians, Babylonians, and many more. In order to highlight some of the ways in which it was used, I would like to visit the courts of the great Assyrian king, Esarhaddon, known to some as a madman and to others as a feeble and easily manipulated king. Esarhaddon's image is not uncomplicated, and though it may not be clear to us how to evaluate his reign, his fascination with divination is abundantly clear. A large collection of letters from his time give us access to his consistent communication with diviners of all types, and allow us to see his very personal day-to-day -day concerns. In particular, he was concerned with conspiracy against the royal house and the threat of assassination a fate which had recently befallen his father, Sennacherib. He also suffered from a chronic illness, possibly lupus, that threatened him just as much as would-be conspirators. Checking the omens before a major battle, or diplomatic arrangement, had always been standard, but Esarhaddon's preoccupation with them was hardly that. In the late 680s BC, tension in the Assyrian court was high over Sennacherib's decision to make Esarhaddon crown prince. Esarhaddon's brothers plotted behind closed doors, planning to usurp power and dispose of him. In an effort to protect the crown prince, Sennacherib had him sent away to the western provinces. Far away from the capital Nineveh, he could wait out the tide of conspiracy while Sennacherib worked to assert control over the situation. Unfortunately, the scheming and jealous sons of the king managed to have him killed, and chaos broke out. Esarhaddon wasted no time returning to the capital to end his murderous foes, and though he successfully quelled the forces of rebellion, some of his brothers managed to escape to the enemy kingdom of Urartu. For the next eleven years, the shadow of Sennacherib's death and the failure to kill the assassins would lay heavy. For the new king, there was always a strong air of suspicion. Could his brothers come back? Maybe he would end up dead just like his father. No one could be trusted to tell him the truth, except the divine arbiters of the world. In his quest to discern the divine will, there were two main disciplines that Esarhaddon could consult, ecstasy and astrology. The former was the study of entrails, and the latter the study of the stars and heavenly bodies, particularly the moon. There were more than forty scholars that practiced these disciplines at the court, many from a Mesopotamian background but several Egyptian and Hurrian ones as well. These scholars were highly trained individuals who had to be well versed in the extensive collections of omens and practices of days gone by. Divination was as serious a study as any, and was certainly not accessible to anyone. Like modern day scholars, diviners had fierce disagreements and strange theories, and were often radically defensive about their qualifications and interpretations. For the astrologers, observations in the sky were open to much interpretation. Bad signs might apply to an enemy or be cancelled out by more auspicious signs. Letters between the king and his scholars show how many signs were interpreted in an effort to avoid any poor outcomes. The astrologers seemed to err on the side of positivity. The ecstasy experts served a slightly different role in that they could consult the gods with questions rather than waiting to see the signs in the sky. Through a standard process of ritual action and consultation with manuals, the answer to the king could be seen on the organs of an animal, mostly sheep livers. Less interpretation was used in the matter, and the outcomes were hard to mitigate. Ever present in Esarhaddon's reign was the legacy of his father's death and his painful disease. For the ancient Mesopotamians, the latter might have been seen as a curse from a god, perhaps because of something his father had done. 
Many letters emerged from Nineveh inquiring about the health and safety of the king. One such query, which I have truncated, reads, Will any of the eunuchs and the bearded officials, the king's entourage or senior members of the royal line, or junior members of the royal line, or any relative of the king whosoever, whether by day or by night, or in the city or in the country, whether while he is sitting on the royal throne, or in a chariot, or in a rickshaw, or while walking, whether while going out or coming in, whether through deceit or guile, or any whatsoever, make an uprising and rebellion against Esarhaddon king of Assyria, will they act with evil intent against him? Another concerned missive inquires about medical treatment for the king. Should Esarhaddon, king of Assyria, as he wishes, drink this drug which is placed before your great divinity? And in drinking this drug, will Esarhaddon, king of Assyria, be rescued and spared? Will he live and get well? One gets the sense of a king that is constantly on the edge, fearful of what the next ram liver might read, or how the stars might foretell his doom. In 671 B.C., Esarhaddon initiated his first substitute king ritual after a successful campaign to Egypt. This was one of the many ways the Assyrian ruler could mitigate the effects of bad omens, but it was considered a rather extreme measure. For a hundred days, a substitute would be placed on the throne, performing all the kingly duties while enjoying the luxuries of the palace. For this duration, the real king was to be known as the farmer, an obscure and hidden man. If the process worked as intended, all the bad omens would be fulfilled for the substitute, and the king would be able to return without suffering from what fate had ordained. And just for extra measure, the substitute would be killed. In the next two years, Esarhaddon would perform this ritual another two times. With the heirs to his throne now declared, he found himself in the same situation his father had been in just a decade earlier. Rivals were surely already plotting to steal the throne. A prophecy about a potential usurper named Sasi came out of the city of Haran, and sympathy for his movement grew. Support for Sasi bled into Babylonia and Assyria. Soon enough, the dignitaries in Esarhaddon's own court were plotting their own schemes. A concerned letter from one of the court diviners informs us on one such plot involving the chief eunuch. It was the month of Marchesvan when Nabu Kilani, the chief cupbearer, fetched me, and I ended up standing in the temple of Bel Haran. The cohort commander re-emerged and took me to an upper room into his presence. There was nobody in his presence except the cohort commander, the major domo, and the chamberlain and the chief cupbearer. In addition, the overseer of the city kept entering and leaving his presence. They tossed me a seat, and I sat down, drinking wine until the sun set. Moving my seat closer, he started speaking to me with the quota of the temple of Nusku, saying, You are an expert in divination? He made me love him. Go and perform the following divination before Shamash. Will the chief eunuch take over the kingship? I washed myself with water in another upper room, donned clean garments, and the cohort commander, having brought up for me two skins of oil, performed the divination and told him, He will take over the kingship. Next day, they libated a jug of wine before, and Bonnie too, and made merry until the sun was low. From that day on, he has been telling me, He, the chief eunuch, will take you back into your father's house and give you the kingship of all of Babylonia. The situation absolutely terrified the king, and no amount of assurance from the diviners at court seemed to put him at ease. Thus, in the year 670, we receive a pithy statement. The king killed many of his magnates in Assyria with the sword. Though this action probably had terrible consequences for the management of the empire, it hit at the root of the problem and put Esarhaddon's fears to rest for the time being. Drastic measures had to be taken to secure power power in such a turbulent time. Of course, no measure was drastic enough to stop the advance of the king's crippling illness, and despite the good omens, his health was destined to fail. In 669 BC, on his way to a campaign in Egypt, Esarhaddon succumbed to his condition. The king may have convinced himself he could control his fate with the proper knowledge of the future, but he was sorely mistaken. If you found this video informative, Make sure to like or subscribe for the algorithm.
and if you are particularly intrigued by the story of Esarhaddon, you can check out the sources I used in the description box.